After a period of bleakness, this is a show about the light ahead. A unique Chinese and Australian co-production exploring the opportunities in both countries after the pandemic. And no better example of this than Amy Lyons. Hello, Amy. Everything works differently in China and it's the same with Chinese coming to Australia. Things work differently here than they do in China. So just more of like cross-cultural understanding, uh, communication, I think goes a long way. Yeah, I'd love some tips from them if they find out the secret to success because I'm, st yeah, I'm still on my way. More of the delightful and entrepreneurial Amy Lyons later. But first... Economics and trade have been my life's work. As the airport economist, I've visited over 60 countries in the past five years, and it's China I've been to most. The business of business between Australia and China is my passion. And whilst there are obvious political tensions now, opportunity awaits. If you're sitting in China, you look around the world, it would be hard to find a country that is easier to invest in or export to than Australia. It's our profitable trade with China that makes us strong. This is a harsh reality. Without China, our prosperity will be affected for every single Australian. Our relationship with China is fundamental to Fortescue's success. A high-powered trade mission to China would be valuable. If there was a trade initiative to visit China with business leaders from Australia, I'd be absolutely um, putting my hand up to be part of that. You build relationships in China around trust and respect. We have an unprecedented number of trade agreements with multiple countries across Asia, and now is the time for business to step through the door. Hi, I'm Tim Harcourt, and you're watching After the Pandemic. Look here, for Australia, that's the future. For China, the opportunity. This is Port Botany, just south of Sydney, Australia's premier container port. Activity here is a great barometer for measuring the state of the economy. So how much has the COVID pandemic affected trade between Australia and China? The answer may surprise you. Container movements are at record levels, driven by a surge in online shopping for computer monitors, furniture, home renovation materials and white goods. Four out of every 10 containers here arrive from China. Watching over all of this surprising activity is Marika Kalfas, the CEO of New South Wales Ports. COVID headlines have all been doom and gloom and trade wars and so on, but You've been pretty busy, haven't you? Well, it's been an interesting trend. And I think what we can say is that there's been such a demand for imports to be moved around the world that, in fact, the containers are all being used, ships are all full, and, in fact, there aren't um, slots available for those ships. So, actually, the whole system is, is full. It's at capacity, uh, which means that it's really important that those containers get back to the locations where they're being filled, a lot of which is in, in China, as quickly as they can to then refill them and bring them back as imports again. Container after container from China. So, Port Botany handles almost all of New South Wales container trade. Uh, and of that container trade, about 40% of the imports um, come from China and about 20% of our exports go to China. But while it demonstrates the strength of their exports, there is something much more profound going on within China itself. China has transformed from a nation of shippers to a nation of shoppers. And it's driven a retail revolution that's only gonna get bigger. Yeah, it's a very nice way of um... Uh, expressing it from shippers to shoppers, that's already happened. That is the current reality. In the last five or six years, domestic consumption's been the single biggest driver of growth in China. And you think about it, Tim, um, in 15 years, China's created something like 300 million middle-class consumers with per capita incomes uh, the global middle class average or higher. So when you go to Shanghai or, or 
Beijing, uh, Shenzhen, Guangzhou, you can just keep going, uh, Qingdao, Dalian, all of those places, uh, then uh, you, what you see are developed economies with all the attributes and characteristics driven by service sector growth rather than manufacturing, um, with growth rates of you know, 3% average, which is global developed country growth rates. Um, and uh, yet you're looking at 300 odd million people, which is around the population of the United States. And that didn't exist 15 years ago. So that's what you're seeing when you talk about China going from shippers to shoppers. It's interesting you say that, you know, when I was a union official and I first went to Shenzhen and I went to a factory and I said to the, the factory manager, do you have workers compensation in China? And it got translated and he came back and he said, uh, no, if the workers break anything, we don't have to compensate. You, know? <laughs> yeah, right. you don't have to compensate us. <laughs> yes. and, and yet, you know, you know, I've gone to that same factory since mm. and uh, they've told me we have trouble getting workers because they want to work in offices, air conditioning and so on. So we've had to introduce piece rates per output to keep people. So that, this tells you this story of the growth of these middle class yes. workers who want yeah. exactly what anyone does. Exactly. And then when you go further away from the eastern littoral of China and the coastal areas and these developed areas of China, um, you've got a vast swathe of provinces which in global terms, in terms of per capita income, average growth rates and so on, you would categorise as newly emerging economies. But there's six, seven hundred million people who are experiencing growth rates of you know, eight, nine, ten percent plus, uh, but still have a long way to go to catch up to the eastern advanced provinces. So this is a fundamental dynamic in the Chinese economy that will sustain growth for a very long time because within this vast economy, vast area, continental size economy, uh, clear, clearly different levels of development with enormous potential for catch up from one level to the next. Few people have traveled as widely in China or are as well connected as Jeff Raby. Two years ago, he was awarded the Order for Australia for services to Australia-China relations. The former ambassador now advises a multitude of clients in both countries. Last year, China was the only major economy in the world, maybe the only economy in the world, that didn't see output fall. Sure, it uh, only grew by something around 2%, which is small for China by the standards of the last 40 years. But this year, the IMF is uh, expecting China to grow by at least 8.2%. And so we are in a very interesting position in terms of the world, world economic growth because uh, the estimates also show that this year, because of China's strong recovery and the you know, enormous size of the Chinese economy, it will account for 26% of world economic growth this year compared to the United States' contribution of only 16%. So in those terms, uh, I think we see a real transformation in the global economy where China is the single largest driver of world economic activity well into the future, no matter what recovery happens elsewhere. And of course, Australia, uh, in normal circumstances, would be a significant beneficiary of that. In November of last year, at the height of the pandemic, the man who knows more about China than perhaps any other Australian launched this book. It's an insider's view of how a once envied relationship between two countries grew frosty. The debate in Australia has become unbelievably polarised. I describe it as a binary debate where the choice is between sycophancy and hostility and that there's nothing in between. Is this the problem that the camps are so divided and they, they dominate, you know, quite a, you know, a, a comprehensive relationship that's very complicated? Absolutely. Uh, it's a huge problem. And the, the China threat industry, as I call it, has very successfully delegitimized commercial and business interest in the bilateral relationship. And this is quite bizarre because commercial and business interests have driven the bilateral relationship in very pragmatic ways over the past 40 years. And Australia has benefited enormously from it. Our living standards today reflect the fact that China went through a massive resources boom and Australian incomes 
uh, increase massively as a result in our well-being and our employment and all of that. What I say to people is that uh, national security depends first and foremost on economic security. And so uh, if you delegitimize the business interest, where is the economic security coming from? Um, and it just is an unfortunate fact based on fundamental economic principles of complementarity that um, uh, we get our economic security from China. And yes, uh, every parrot in the uh, pet shop can talk about diversification, but much easier said than done. China's steel production in uh, 1992 was about 95 million tonnes per annum. India's today is 95 million tonnes per annum. That's the gap. And yeah, it's, it's, it's tough for policymakers to adapt to having the most dominant, important influence in our national affairs standing so, par so far apart from us in terms of values and institutional norms. But hey, you know, <laughs> that's the world we, we, we live in. We have to work out how we live in a world as we find it, not as we wish it to be. It's not beyond the skill of our diplomats and our policy advisory community to figure out how to do it. But currently, as I said, uh, we've couched the debate in terms of uh, sycophancy or militancy. <laughs> What you're saying is Australia is in a hole, we need to dig ourselves out with diplomacy, with diplomatic nuance. Yeah, it's not too late, we can still do it. Absolutely, but I think it's quite hard now from where we have positioned ourselves. Uh, I, I, you have to believe you can do it. And the good thing about international relations is ultimately interests prevail. What I'm calling for and arguing for is, is, is a realist view of the world in which we live. We can't change China, it is what it is. Um, and it is a country that we have benefited enormously from, and we must never forget that. When you ask and think about what's changed, it is the US that's changed, and we have gone along with that position. Our approach to China shifted from around 2016, 2017. And what happened then? Well, effectively, the US decided that it would move from a policy of 40 years of engaging China in a constructive, cooperative way to a policy of seeking to contain and push back China. And Australia has since then glued itself to the hip of the United States in a way that doesn't really make sense. It's quite um, logical and normal for the dominant power to resist the ascendant power and push back against the ascendant power. But it's not for other countries. We have to work out how we advance our interests in this uh, uh, world where the dominant power it does feel under threat. But just gluing ourselves to the hip of the dominant power uh, does nothing to advance our interests. And in fact, as we see today, positively harms our interests. It's at this point that I'd like to return to Amy Lyons. He's making my favorite dish, gongba jiling, kung pao chicken. Yum. Her story is an interesting one, and what she learnt before COVID will go a long way in helping businesses understand what to do in a post-pandemic world. This is what? Oh, These days, the woman they call Blondie in China is a hugely successful mm. internet influencer, blogging about food and fitness to her tens of thousands of followers in Australia and China. This selfie stick, I've had it for four or five years now since I started making videos and of course I bought it on Taobao. So I am here at Jiangnan Restaurant here in Sydney. It's one of my favourite restaurants in Chinatown. I'm about to dig into this amazing Kung Pao chicken. A journey that began in 2015 when this cheerleading language expert was chosen to represent Australia in a Chinese TV show called Chinese Bridge Competition. Very exciting. I landed, I was part of this crazy whirlwind of a competition, kind of like The Voice. You know, you have your judges, you have a live audience, and you're there giving a speech or answering questions. And it was the craziest experience ever. And it kind of gave me that in an understanding of Chinese social media. It was as a part of that show that I started my Weibo account. I grew some amount of followers and that was kind of the springboard that I kind of pushed off in later years. 
成为森林里最高的树。So this Chinese bridge competition. Yeah. I mean, how many people watch this show? A lot. So I was used to when a show is a show is going well in Australia, maybe it gets a one million viewing base. This show was watched by I want to say like a hundred million people. Like it's a big show, a big deal. And when I heard that number, actually after the show had finished airing, I was like. You're telling me that 100 million people are gonna see my face on TV. It was such a foreign concept to me, and it kind of birthed this idea of like, wow, like 1.3 billion people in China. If you are being watched by even one percent of the population, that's you know many million views. And I've learned that that's a very naive viewpoint to go into China with to think that. Just because oh you appeal to one percent you'll get this. It's it's a lot harder than that actually. A lot of businesses have this misconception about China that、yes. you know if you sell everyone a pair of socks, you'll make a mot. So it's a lot more complicated than that, isn't it? Oh, it is. So many people go into China with this viewpoint that oh 1.3 billion people in China, I'll one、uh, percent of the population like my product, I'll be a billionaire. It's really really a lot harder than that. And what couple of tips would you give to Aussies Aussie businesses going to China? Just be willing to learn, and don't think that going to China things are going to be the same in Australia because they aren't. They aren't, and you're going to fail miserably unless you go out of your way and really, really learn. Learn some of the local language. Learn the history behind it. Learn why you can't go into a business meeting and expect to sign a contract on your first meeting because that's not going to happen. Everything works differently in China, and. It's the same with Chinese coming to Australia. Things work differently here than they do in China. So, just more of like cross-cultural understanding,、uh, communication, I think, goes a long way. Of course, all of this was easier pre-COVID, when travel was possible. But now, with vaccines coming online, it's time to prepare to meet and greet again in a post-pandemic world. Amy's point is that human-to-human -human contact is better than shouting across oceans. <laughs> In Australia, the old saying goes, "It's always darkest before dawn." In China, it's after rain comes sunshine. The pandemic has tested countries and fractured friendships, but it will end. Light is in sight. The world economy is about to recover from the worst of COVID. What's that going to mean for the port? Do you have the capacity, particularly if you know China leads? A very strong global economic recovery. Will you have the capacity to to be able to to be able to look after and facilitate that sort of trade trade growth? Yeah, I mean, part of our long term strategy is to make sure that we do have capacity for future growth. So at the moment, we're handling around two and a half million TEU or twenty foot container equivalents each year. But our berths and our infrastructure and the land. Is able to handle more than three times that. We can handle upwards of seven million TUs. There needs to continue to be investment in operations and equipment to service a growing volume, but we have more than enough capacity at the port to be able to handle changing trade needs and trade growth. But more than that, for Australia to really capitalise on the post-pandemic opportunities, it needs to match China's energy as an exporter. So we need exports to pay for our imports. <laughs> We definitely need exports, and we need more of them, because out of every ten boxes that we import full, six of those boxes go out empty. We, our biggest export is air, and actually, it's a relatively unproductive part of the supply chain. So, the more we can fill those empty boxes, I think the more productive we're going to be in this country. Now, you're back in Australia because of COVID. You'll be、yeah. bouncing back to China soon,、Hopefully、no doubt.、Yeah. Soon, no doubt. <laughs> What would you advise Australian businesses about going to China? Would you just say, like you did, just get over there and immerse yourself, or would、yeah. you say, do the research of what the Chinese want yeah, from yeah, Australia? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I definitely would say. Whatever you do, if you want to succeed in China, you need to do your research. You need to get there. You need to spend some time. You need a local person that can tell you the lay of the land about how the country works. Because I can guarantee you, going to China is very different from what you may be used to in your home country.、Um, A lot of things are different about China. It's a, a, for one thing, it's a largely cash a cashless society.、Uh, a lot of transactions happen on payment platforms like WeChat Pay or AliPay, and. Coupled with the fact that China is also a very digitally savvy society, there's an app for everything. 
everything is online. Um, you've got these major shopping holidays like a Shuang Shi Yi Double Eleven Singles Day, where fifty billion dollars is in revenue is generated in one day. So it it's a everything is online, everything is cashless, and so I think people need to understand that. When you go there, what is to stop? Why is someone going to go out of their way to buy your product or choose your service when there are thousands of other options on the market to choose from? It is just so easy in China to get what you want. For example, right now, if I have my phone on me, I can take a photo of this bowl, this exact bowl. I can upload that into Taobao, the one of the online retailing giants in China. And it will scan its database for this exact bowl, this exact product, and within seconds, it'll come up with a list, pages, pages, pages long, of this exact item or items that look like this. And within seconds, I can press buy now, go through my WeChat Pay, scan my face, my my payment is done, and that product will be on my doorstep tomorrow. It's just so easy. So I think people need to realize what it takes to grow a brand in China, what it takes to. Uh, get the attention of Chinese people. Why is someone going to buy your product when they have so many different options in the market? Whether it comes to social media, launching a business, starting a service, it's there's so much competition. It's one of, in my opinion, one of the most fierce, brutal, and com like competition-based markets in the world that you could do anything. Is it amazing that the uh, <laughs> that the communist society has taught us all about capitalist competition? Oh yeah, there's a, a lot of buying and selling happening. <laughs> An English Prime Minister famously said, "Jaw jaw is better than war war." In other words, cool heads and calm words are the smart option in any crisis. Wise advice, not least because the economic stakes in the Australia-China relationship are just too high. When we're talking about middle classes of 300 million people emerging in 15 years, obviously no other country on earth can match that. Okay. Well, economics is all about life chances and opportunity. So, let's hope we can build the middle class and reduce poverty in China, and, and of course, provide the opportunity for Australian workers and their families that the relationships provide. Yeah, and well, just simply to continue to benefit for from it over the next forty years, as we have over the last forty years, remembering all the time that China is not uh, a threat to our security, um, and recognizing that uh, it's not going to go away. Jeff Raby, thanks for being on the show. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, Tim. Thank you.